Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Hello, everybody. This is Andrew Trollson. I am an instructor here at Intertech. And what I want to do in this video, <clears throat> excuse me, is to uh, give you kind of a little taste of our complete WPF class. Now you can see on the screen right now, I put down the words short form. This is kind of a condensed version of the full chapter one of the class. And the reason it's condensed is because if I were to lecture over all the material and kind of walk you through all the labs, that takes a pretty good part of the first day of class. And I'm sure you don't want to be online with me for five hours or whatever, so we won't be doing that. But what I do want to do here is to kind of set a foundation for you so you understand the nature of WPF <clears throat> and you also understand some of the details of working with the programming model. So what I want to do is fire up and um, I'll be going back and forth between PowerPoint and a couple of different demos. We'll talk about Expression Blend. I'll talk about Visual Studio. I'll kind of talk about some of the syntax of XAML itself. So why don't we just kind of get right into it here. Now, historically speaking, if you've worked with any of the Microsoft UI toolkits in the past, you know, whether it be MFC or VB6 or Windows Forms, they were all essentially just wrappers around some of the real basic Windows operating system primitives, like User32 and GDI. And that's okay, but under these older models, what we typically would find is that when you wanted to build up a full-scale, feature-rich desktop application, you had to wear some very, very different hats, right? Let me just skip to this slide here and then I'll go backwards, but let's look at this little chart right here. This is kind of the way things used to be, right? <clears throat> if we wanted to build up some basic main windows, we had to pick a toolkit. And if we wanted to throw in some graphics, we had different toolkits, and they both had very, very different programming models. So, you know, the way that you would write code to do DirectX 3D, wickedly different programming model than just making a dialog box with Windows Forms. So the, the basic idea here is that before we had WPF, things were pretty asymmetrical. Now, with the release of .NET 3.0, you know, some time back, and continuing forward, Microsoft gave us another alternative called Windows Presentation Foundation. Now, this is an alternative toolkit. It has nothing to do with Windows Forms. That doesn't necessarily mean that Windows Forms is obsolete. You know, Windows Forms can still be a nice choice if you want to kind of, you know, quickly pull together a smaller, simple business application. Uh, I don't mean simple as in trivial, but I just mean you don't need any glitz or glam, right? You just want to have your menu, your status bar, maybe a grid full of data. You can put that together very quickly in WPF as well, but you know where WPF really shines is where you want to start to incorporate these richer features like streaming video or 3D graphics. If you want to start to do um, customization of control content, that can be done extremely quickly under WPF without the need to subclass different parent classes, for example. And I'll kind of touch on that topic a little bit later on. So here's the way that things are nowadays. Okay, here's the same general chart, but notice now, no matter what you need, WPF is kind of a one-stop shop. Now this is good because now things are much, much more symmetrical, right? So the programming model that we use to do 3D graphics or to work with a PDF style document or just make a, a traditional main window, we're all going to use the same toolkits now. <clears throat> so the same programming model, we have the same you know, use of XAML, which is strictly speaking not mandatory but very, very useful. So the good news for us is if you start to climb that WPF learning curve, you know, once you kind of get the basic building blocks figured out, you're going to find that it's very easy to just roll in new functionality as opposed to the previous model where we were constantly flipping our hats on and off. Let's talk a little bit about this XAML feature, right? Um, 
It's pretty easy to think at the beginning that XAML is just about describing a GUI. Now, certainly that's where XAML can be really, really helpful, but understand that, strictly speaking, XAML can be used to describe any .NET object provided that it has a default constructor. And there's not as much support for generics as we might hope. But, those two things aside, anything can be described in markup. So if you wanted to, you could describe a system.string. You could describe in markup a custom collection that you wrote, or a custom business object. Okay, so it doesn't have to have a visible user interface. And also be aware too that XAML is found in places beyond WPF. If any of you have looked at um, Windows Workflow Foundation, under 4.0, that's all driven through XAML as well. Same thing for the XML paper specification. You know, that's working on a XAML dialect too. So we'll be focusing here on, on the WPF XAML. But if you understand the basic building blocks, you'll find it pretty easy to look at Silverlight code or Windows Phone 7 code and get a pretty quick idea as to what's going on there. Now, essentially all XAML is, is it's an XML-based grammar, which allows us to describe a, um, an object, okay? The big motivation for this is for a separation of concerns. So this is good. Now, if any of you folks have worked with ASP.NET in the past, things are gonna feel eerily familiar. We're gonna have one file that describes the way things look and feel. That would be the XAML file. And then typically, the XAML file is going to be paired up with a code file. And that's where we can describe all the functionality of how it operates. Right? So we have a nice separation of concerns. Now, the cool thing about WPF, though, is that the separation of concerns is also carried out to the tool level. Right? Now, if you wanted to, you could completely stay within the confines of Visual Studio, and write all your WPF programs there. Now, I'll be perfectly honest, that was my mindset a couple years ago. Um, I was pretty happy just typing in the markup, typing in the code, kind of rolling my own solutions. But then when I started to do some more complicated things, like building control templates, or working with animations, or trying to put together um, graphics through markup, well, then things became really, really tedious. Even in Visual Studio 2010, we still do not have all of the built-in editors and wizards that would be really, really useful to kind of get us more productive. So eventually, I finally decided to check out this complementary product called Expression Blend, right? And nowadays, I am a true believer. I've drank the Kool-Aid, if you will. Um, Expression Blend is a Microsoft product which is really here for one primary reason. It will be generating all the XAML for WPF, Silverlight, and Windows Phone 7 projects for you, right? Tons of built-in editors and wizards and animation tools that will just take a lot of the tediousness out of authoring the markup. Now the cool thing is, and some of you might know this directly, but an Expression Blend project is the exact same file format as a Visual Studio project. So you can open up the same body of code in either tool. And then you can kind of maximize the tool's strengths, right? XAML's the best choice if you have to put together really sophisticated markup. That's what Blend's all about. If you want to put together all the deep, deep code, well, that's what Visual Studio is all about. So these two things work together as a complement, okay? And I'll let you show you Expression Blend in a little demo here pretty quick. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.